Hello. Good to see you after such a long time. I have been stuck at home, just like most of us. And I hope you all are doing well and taking care of yourselves. <clears throat> I was able to access my office today, so I thought I should record my last lecture on Eagleton's book, uh, Literary Theory. And that is his conclusion to the book, which he also subtitles as political criticism. Now, in the very beginning of the chapter, what Eagleton is explaining to us is that by subtitling the chapter political criticism, what he is a political criticism, and then there is political criticism. But his argument is that deep down, every form of criticism has a politics. Even a disavowal of politics is a kind of politics. But what he sees in humanistic criticism, especially liberal humanist criticism, is a tendency to draw away from the word and into the literary text, right? We saw that in new criticism. We saw that in structuralism, informalism. But he sees that as a, as a politics, right? But what he's also suggesting is He's taking us back to his introduction where he had put the whole question of literature being a stable object under erasure. And since literature cannot be stable and is socially defined, similarly, a literary theory cannot be generalized and cannot be a complete all encompassing literary theory. So what he means by political criticism is acknowledging that criticism by its very nature has a certain politics and based on those politics we approach literary texts a certain way. Now if you believe in a certain kind of liberal humanistic bourgeois identity of individual being free, democracy being the ultimate form of government, uh, you know, rights of the people, and then you take that and you apply it to literature, assuming that literature in one way or the other can carry the burden of these societies and can represent it. But deep down, what Eagleton believes is that that bourgeois liberal humanism functions and can go and read texts and literatures in a world in which people are billionaires and then there are people starving on the street, right? Right now we have COVID-19 going on. Uh, how apolitical can we be when we know that there are people dying because they have no access to testing, they have no access to cures, and then there are people who can afford that. This is an unequal world, so we cannot assume a humanity having the same kind of human attributes or same kind of access to materials, but that's the the problem of bourgeois liberalism, that it assumes its own privilege, Eurocentric location, right, as universal. And within that, then literature can be posited as this stable medium that people go and read and learn. Then Eagleton also suggests that the reason he is not giving a theory of political criticism in his last chapter is because that would suggest that as suggest that there is a political literary criticism and then political literary criticism. Literature, literary criticism has a certain politics, right? It offers itself as an expert opinion first on literature. And then eventually what he suggests is, well, we can also study films. We can also study things happening in culture. So it's also becomes cultural studies. Within that, then those who constantly insist on a universal mode of aesthetic appeal of literature and studying it already belong to a certain privileged class. They are the ones who decide the canon. And then after having decided it, after having written about it, you know, they try to palm that off as natural. Same goes with uh, about the transformative power of literature, that it can make us better people. But what do we mean by better people, right? 
because that's a political definition. Is it someone who is refined enough to read a poem critically and talk about it? Is that a better person? Or is it a person who's compassionate, who's kind, who's generous, who's egalitarian? So that idea that literature can transform us into better people is also has a certain politics. Then he touches upon, you know, the feminist scholarship, which he considers has traditionally been political. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they can't use structuralism or formalism or linguistics, right? The idea is why is it political? Because it questions the system itself. It questions what does a text normalize, right? It questions what happens to women in literature, but also in real world. What kind of an impact a text can have if we don't see how gender plays a role in it. Now that's political, but what they are doing with the text is pretty similar. They are reading it carefully and then pointing out its inconsistencies, its patriarchal bent, right? Same goes with Marxist and socialist criticisms, right? What do the socialists read in a text? What do they want the text to do to deal with issues of inequity, injustice? And that's what is used as a derogatory term sometimes, like when people would tell you, oh, you're being too political. The idea behind is, is that if you don't perform political readings of the text, then you've internalized a certain so-called dispassionate way of reading literature, which defaults onto the politics of the dominant group that has privileged them. So if you look at all the literary criticism or techniques or methods that have come up, feminism, post-colonial studies, socialistic studies, all of these do two things according to Eagleton. They study texts, not just literature, but they also question the validity of the canon itself, right? And then they also study within the text as to what does the text do in the world, right? How does it impact the reader? How does it represent the world? So the question automatically become political. He, towards the end of his conclusion, also gives us a brief overview of what could be preferred. I mean, he says that even though he uh, has criticized all these theories in the book, he is very traditionalist. And he says, well, maybe we could go to rhetoric. And what does he mean by that? He said, when well, the rhetorical studies of text, first of all, didn't just rely on one body of literature, one body of text as literature. It studied how a text functions, right? How is it constituted? How other people have written a speech or an essay? And so rhetorical studies or the rhetoricians will go and study how someone has argued. How is that argument effective? What does it do to the listener and to the reader, right? And he says that we don't need to go and use the classical techniques of vocabularies of rhetoric, but maybe we can do a kind of political criticism that asks those questions of the object of study, which is literature. But literature itself still remains for Eagleton something unstable, something that is defined by those who have the power to constitute things, power to write about them, power to construct a canon, right? It's not, and, and he has a great discussion of Shakespeare in there. It's not that you just accidentally run into literature and pick it up and say, oh, wow, this is great literature. That act of believing in that is deeply implicated in the discursive framework of our own education, who taught us, who taught us to value what, where do we come from? What do we value in a text? All of that is a certain kind of politics. Then also there is a critique of this idea that if we say literature is useful, that's utilitarian. And as literature scholars, we should not be able to talk. We shouldn't be talking about that it can it can be useful in teaching humanity or teaching compassion. No, no, no. The idea in traditional sense is, no, we should just study literature. And he said, even those, even new critics, 
and structuralists found literature useful to prove their point, right? That's a different kind of use, but none of them simply wanted to read literature for its own sake. They were mobilizing it to a certain use to prove that this structure exists here or to prove this is how language can be felt in this, right? And we should not be afraid of suggesting that we can use literary texts and literature to learn something about the world, right? To learn how to conduct ourselves in the world. And so we should not be afraid of that. In this chapter, there's also a critique of English departments and their precarious role within the state institutions, right? How they are funded by the state, but then they are, give, they are given a mission, right? Um, most of the times the mission is to train young minds to think critically, but also to be cultured. But the question is, you know, that process undermines itself when you put, you know, people together to read texts and talk about it critically. There is no way you can control it, right? They will start questioning the assumptions behind the text themselves, behind the mission of the department. Right, so maybe, you know, we ought to create literature departments or literary studies that questions its own methodologies instead of just teaching this is the method, this is the way to do it. So by way of conclusion then in this chapter, what Eagleton is doing is he's going back to his earlier assumption in the introduction that literature itself is not a stable object of study. And since the object of study can be defined in so many different ways, it cannot have a stable literary theory. And it can be different kinds of literary theories, right? All of them have political assumptions about them, even the ones that are claiming to be deeply aesthetic, right? And then there is a critique of liberal humanism and its assumptions, right? So. Whenever there is a critique of liberal humanism from the left, it's usually the critique of bourgeois liberal humanism that assumes certain tropes about humanity, that there is a central human subject. All human beings are naturally driven towards freedom. Capitalism is the only way to live. These are some of the bourgeois li liberal assumptions these days, or believing in trickle-down economics, or just believing that elections can fix things, right? All of these critiques are critiques because deep down in liberal bourgeois humanism, there is a certain privileged human subject who's assumed, and that tends to be male, right? And all these Critiques coming from the periphery are first of all pointing out the human subject that you're imagining as liberal and generous and kind is the very subject under whom colonialism happened, you know, under whom people were exploited. People are still being exploited, right? So that entire edifice of, of liberal humanism and its assumptions about itself and the West, they crumble. Right. And so he is hinting at a socialistic mode of reading. What does socialism want? Right. Basically, a more equitable redistribution of resources, access to education, a more a, a life in which people don't have to worry about everyday exigencies of life, where their basic needs are taken care of so that they can share the wealth of the planet or the countries in which they live, right? And socialism, according to Eagleton and a lot of other socialist mm, critics, can create a world like that, right? Where democracy does exist, but where protections are there for people, where wealth is not amassed at the top, right? Where power is evenly redistributed, where global inequities, inequalities are addressed. Right? where you don't live in United States or Canada and elsewhere and live your liberal life using the materials produced by slave labor elsewhere, you know, where you acknowledge that and try to change it. That's where he's going with that. So overall, in the conclusion of the book, then he's going back to his original argument in the introduction where he introduces the, concept, the idea that literature itself is not a stable object of study 
hence literary theory also cannot be a stable object of study, that most of the way we value a text is socially constructed, right? And then in the last chapter, when he's talking about political criticism, he's suggesting ways in which we can perform political criticism, feminism, eco-criticism, you know, post-colonial studies, studies of decolonization, all of these, and of course, Marxism, all of these are political ways of reading the literary texts, but also other texts. So what he's also opening up is that it shouldn't just be novels and poetry. We should be able to read film. We should be able to read games or whatever and write about them. So by and large, in this concluding chapter, then the way he's concluding is the same thing that we have to keep in mind what produces value, how are our value systems produced, how are they ideological and discursively produced as well, and keeping that in mind as we study literature, as we teach literature, you know, as we write about it. These are some of the things that come to my mind after reading this brief concluding chapter. Now, I am open to questions. Uh, you can very easily post questions in the comment section below. This entire uh, playlist is available on my channel and you can watch it. And anytime you have any questions, please post them under uh, in the comment section and I'll try to address them and maybe, um, you know, record another lecture to answer those questions. But overall, this lecture concludes my discussion of pretty much all the chapters of Terry Eagleton's introduction to liter uh, literary theory. I hope this has been useful to you and uh, I hope you use it in your classes and in for your own learning. But do keep in mind that these lectures can only help you if you also read the book itself. I am so grateful to you for being part of this entire experiment, not experiment, experience. And I will be back with some more videos as and when I have time. Meanwhile, stay safe and healthy. Take care of each other, right, during these trying times. And if all goes well, I will see you next time. Until then, peace and love. And please do subscribe, okay? Okay, bye-bye and peace and love.